This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. Welcome into another episode of Booth Review. I'm Ken Swanson here with my guy Brandon McAnderson. BMac, how are we doing, man? I'm fantastic. I am glad to be here. I love to review in the booth. <laughs> hey, man, I do too. I, uh, I, there's a lot to review. This, this feels like a little. Might, this might be a little season reviewish on Booth Review today. And hey, just a reminder, this is presented by our dear friends at M Prize Bank, member FDIC, a wonderful partner here for KC Sports Network. BMAC, uh, how was Cincinnati? Did you get any Skyline Chili? I did not. Um, I'm not into chili as a Good. as a theme. You know, like I don't go <laughs> to buy chili. Like, where's the last time you bought chili? I, I would say if you ask somebody the last time they bought chili, seven out of ten would say Wendy's. And that's barely <laughs> But really Mm. Chili is a place to be made at home. You know, you're not supposed to go places to eat chili. So put it on uh, spaghetti. I, I put it on spaghetti. spaghetti. Yeah, oh, put it on spaghetti. That doesn't sound right to me. And it's cool. Like, that's what they do. But I will say the city looked nice. Uh, the stadium was really cool. Cincinnati Stadium was really cool. Their city was cool. The riverfront stuff was pretty cool. So I, I had a good time. And then the football was excellent. Hey, did you, random question, did you have time by any chance to like, would you have had time to go eat a meal by, by, you know, or take some people for a meal or something if you, like while you were there, like, did you have enough downtime to go find somewhere? Yeah. I should have thought, man, I didn't, I wasn't even thinking about this. There is a, there's a incredible taco place over there. Mm. It's like a, it's a bourbon and taco bar. Mm. And so it's, Yeah. It's pretty great, man. I I'll I should have I should have thought to let you know because that place is, I, it's one of my favorite spots. Yeah, so they, yeah, yeah. They, uh, they had Carlos Dunlap, former Super Bowl champion of the Chiefs, mm-hmm. has a restaurant across from the hotel we stayed at called okay. Un- Uninhibited. Fantastic. He's from Charleston, South Carolina. There's some Gullah flavors in there. Creole, creative menu, great cocktails. Mm. Cool place. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I think you did all right. I yeah. think you did all right for yourself. Yeah. But, but yeah, man, hey, look, uh, I it was weird watching that game, um, you know, because there wasn't a ton of energy in, in the stands and there wasn't a lot of people there. And it was so fun, so refreshing. So many different emotions I felt watching Kansas just ob- obliterate another opponent in a kind of, you know, that, that it was just so weird to watch that game where – you know, there's been some moments in the past where, now I know I harp on the past a little bit, but just comparing some of the, you know, feelings of, you know, watching a game that, you know, may, maybe a little bit of an empty stadium and watching a really good football team walk in and and, and beat KU in, in a similar fashion. I can't tell you how fun it was to just watch this team methodically dominate another opponent and just, I mean, look how far this team's come, man. Like that was just, there was so many emotions tied to that you know, Kansas brought their own energy. Kansas didn't need to feed off of anything. They walked in and they beat the brakes off of another team and did it for their eighth win of the year. It was just kind of like a weird, surreal, fun moment for me. I don't know. It was great to watch. Yeah, it was incredible, man. I will say that the Cincinnati crowd was good to start the game. I mean, considering all the circumstances, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was a mostly full place, except for the student section is where they were missing most people because of the holiday. Thanksgiving, yeah. I was actually impressed by their turnout. And I was impressed by their whole thing. So props to Cincinnati. They got a good thing going there. Um, and then the football itself, you know, Cincinnati was a team that I lo- thought looked pretty good on film and they had good players at every level, pretty competitive players. Um, I just thought that Bean was a straight buzzsaw. I mean, his um, his accuracy in the passing game, you know, if you're talking about a margin for error percentage on throws, I mean, he didn't put the ball in any danger, but was in some of the tightest windows and he did it so confidently. And, you know, Jason has these sort of physical mannerisms that you could kind of figure what kind of mood he's in. And that early scramble where he ran around the edge and looked like actual lightning. I was like, wait a minute, (laughs) we haven't seen this version of this player in a few weeks, you know, just because he's been banged up a little bit here and there. But Mm -hmm. I mean, he was fully locked in from a health perspective, fully locked in from a mental perspective. And it was a game where, you know, Cincinnati was committed to the run. You know, the first first two drives, they had 11 people within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. They made it clear that they were going to force Kansas to to get out of their game plan. And it worked. The problem is, is that Bean was in fuego. 
So it was a game plan that worked. It was a pretty good team. And can't, and like you said, they went out there and finished them, you know, and not a raucous crowd. You know, it wasn't like it was crazy, crazy, but it was pretty full. Cool. But they emptied that thing out pretty quick, too. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, you know, a little sluggish early, but then they just kind of got rolling and both sides of the ball started really kind of establishing their will on on Cincinnati. And yeah, I think Cincinnati, like I think Lance Leipold even said Cincinnati's better than their record indicated. And I think that's true. Like, even though Kansas just went in there and whooped them, like there are there are redeemable qualities on that t- in that program. I mean, Dante Corleone's a very good football player. Uh, he just found out he's going to be back next year. So that's, mm-hmm. a, that's someone else, you know, that they're going to have to can't handle. But I just thought Kansas played a really efficient football game, just really sound, really, um, you know, just efficient. I mean, like you're looking at Jason Bean, 13 to 17, 250 yards, 14.7 yards per attempt, two touchdowns, just <laughs> like they, 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 they let it fly 17 times, but like it was something crazy. Like they started. 10, he started like 10 out of 10, 11 out of 11, something crazy like that. And, you know, they, they picked some good time. They, they found some good time to, you know, kind of, kind of attack down the field a little bit. And they caught Cincinnati in some, some coverage mistakes, some bad coverages, and they really exploited them down the field. Yeah. I mean, they made their back end pay. That's where Cincinnati was inexperienced. You know, they had some richer freshmen back there. Uh, they had a, a guy that KU heavily recruited back there playing corner. They targeted him quite a bit. Um, they just were able to, like you said, the efficiency was there. Uh, the route concepts were there. You know, there was a crispness to the way that they were operating. And it was all good to see. And like I said, being that throw to Jared Casey with the free rusher, um, the location of that ball and the window that he threw it in was laughable. I mean, it was laughable. You know, like I laughed out loud to myself because it, you know, there was nowhere else to put that ball. And the catch by Casey was amazing. And when quarterbacks are making plays like that, they're in full, fully in control. When you're, when you're getting an, an unblocked rusher, a speed rusher, this is a fast second level player, then you're able to deliver a ball in a window like that. I mean, I looked over at Leipold and saw his mouth go, wow. <laughs> this is not a, you know, I don't see him respond to plays very often. Uh, he had to get out a wow on that just the accuracy and the execution. And that was just the beginning. I mean, it continued. Uh, Devin Neal is just a game breaker. Um, the way he can make people miss and get up to top speed. You know, you look up and he's got a hundred yards and you're like, man, he's barely played today. <laughs> you know that, that was the, basically he played about 10, he ran the ball 10 times. He'd take carries. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow, Devin's barely played today. Mm-hmm. And that's just where the team is. You know, like they can throw um, Tory Lachlan out there and run an option. You know, they can hand him the ball. You know, they could put in McDuffie. You know, Sevion Morrison has looked like like lightning with his opportunities the last yep. couple of weeks. You know, they just are a loaded team with a lot of guys coming back. Yeah. Well, that's I think that's the you know, we can talk a little bit about that here in a bit. Uh, but yeah, I, I wanted to focus on Jason a little bit too, because like he definitely deserves it, man. And I could I'm glad that you, you know, you kind of emphasize him because like such I mean, that's yeah. That's K. It's, it's KU's QB two coming into the season, and I want to talk about the honors here in a minute. He earns honorable mention all conference. I mean, KU's QB two is out here getting love, you know, you know, in, in the voting. <laughs> and I know, like, you know, he's thrown. He had a ridiculous game right against, you know, against Oklahoma State and lit up, you know, lit it up in the air. I think this was his best game. I think this was his best game. Statistically, I know, like. 250 yards on 17 pass attempts is insane. Four carries, 90 yards, big explosives, closing this thing out. It was just, it was so, it, it was so cool. It's like a full circle moment for him and his growth and his development as a player. And he looks a lot different than he did when he first got here. Um, and he's grown tremendously. And I think the staff has talked about his growth. I, I'm so impressed with, you know, with, what he's been able to do and what he's been able to put together. And he deserves a lot of love and recognition because think of like, and, and this isn't knocking a, a Cole Ballard or an Ethan Vasco. If he doesn't, you know, leave because of Jason beans return, but how glad are you to have Jason Bean be a, be a Jayhawk this year? Right? Like he, he 
carried a big burden for this team to get to eight and four. And it's just, I, I he deserves he deserves a lot of fun. Like I, I know, like you know, there's going to be some weird pieces of his legacy where people are going to compare him to Jalen Daniels, and people are going to remember some some moments and stuff here or there. But like, this dude's been a really good football player, and he's been one of the best quarterbacks in the Big Twelve. And uh, I'm just so glad that he came back and helped lead this team to another kind of new height that we haven't seen in a really long time. Yeah, Jason to me is um, he's everything that what what we like to represent the University of Kansas, like the the Jayhawk spirit, like that unwillingness to quit. Those are always people's favorite on the hardwood, right? The guy that just will not give up. You know, the guy that keeps improving, the guy that keeps finding a way to get into a tight rotation. You know, like a Mitch Lightfoot and a Tyrell Reed and these kind of guys like that. And uh, that's what Jason Bean is, except. He, he can be the best quarterback in the country on any given night. So not only is he a grinder that learned how to get the job done and was monumental, you think about his the pillars of what he has become to this university. The first opportunity for Leipold to play on national TV was Coastal Carolina. We didn't know what the team was going to be. You know, we won our opening game, barely. You know, we were 1-0. We felt okay about it. And um, they came out and kicked us in the mouth. And made it hard, right? And in the second half, he came out like a tornado. He had two long touchdown rounds, one on a scramble right before halftime. And you look up and the whole country could say, wow, we're in a game against a ranked team. How cool is that? That was him. All right. Then he kind of, he steps away. He struggles with the rest of the year. The offensive line struggles. Jalen emerges. And then we need to win another game to get to a bowl game. And Jalen is not available. And Bean delivers again. And we beat Oklahoma State. That's a huge run. Huge tip. The run. <laughs> that, that run down the left sideline. So you think about all these huge moments that he's directly involved in. It makes his career here so special. Like there's going to be a, a historic place in the in college football at the University of Kansas just for Jason Bean, for his ability to overcome hard times, for his ability to block out the noise, for his ability to grow as a player from a skill perspective, from a leadership perspective. Every week, every week. Like that throw that he made with the with the pressure free runner, he's not been able to make that play in his career here. He hasn't been able to. He made it there like he's done it a million times, mm-hmm. and that's what that's what makes him so special. Is that in any given night he can be the best player in the country, and that's just a testament to his skill and his will and the coaching staff for identifying him. He was he was right up there as one of the better players in the country against the against Cincinnati that day. Like he was out of his mind. He earns all Big Twelve honorable mention. I want to talk about a few of these guys because there's definitely some players that are are worth talking about. But before we get into that, just a reminder, Homefield Apparel uh, is one of our partners here at KC Sports Network. They have some absolutely unbelievable products that you can take advantage of. Uh, no Seas 23 is the promo code that gets you 15% off. I'm rocking a Kansas sweatshirt right now. They've got all kinds of incredible selection. They got uh, KU football, KU basketball, uh, apparel as well so make sure you're taking advantage of that promo code no seats 23 gets you a discount there at home field apparel we're gonna be take a break and we'll be back right after this thanks for listening to kc sports network make sure you download our new app find it on the app store or google play just search kc sports network to everybody hanging out with us here on Booth Review presented by Emprise Bank member FDIC. I just got done talking about, you know, Jason Bean getting honorable mention all Big 12, which is just a great it's just a that's just a great honor for him. I'm really glad he earned that. There's some other very notable awards that were handed out uh on Wednesday though, B Mac. I want to start with this. Austin Booker is a first team all Big 12 player and the defensive newcomer of the year. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. The tape was that good this year. He is He is just like, it, it's been so impressive what he's been able to put together so far in a Kansas uniform beat. Yeah, he's just, I mean, he's so explosive. He's so twitchy. Um, I remember the, the opening game, he had a rush where he spun inside. He beat the guy by a mile and the back came to help and he just steamrolled the back. The back was 6'2", 220. Steamrolled the back, went straight through him and forced the pressure. And I thought, Huh? Like he's six six. 
He's not supposed to be able to do this. He's not supposed to be able to bend like that. He's not supposed to be able to change direction like that. And as it progressed, I kept telling myself, he can't. And we'll see, you know, like, as the challenge yeah. increases, you'll kind of see what he's about. And that Texas game, uh, oh my, you're talking about two NFL tackles, certain, certain top 30 picks at NFL tackle for Texas on both sides somewhere in the future. And Austin Booker was just as dominant. There was a play where he had banks on, on literal skates. And I mean, pushing him back to where his feet were sliding underneath him. He wreaked havoc in the first half of that football game. And then I was a complete believer because I knew the talent that Texas had at that position, and it made no difference. Well, and I think one of them said that the best pass rusher they went up against this season was Austin Booker. Um, I don't remember which one, but one of them said the the best pass rusher we went up against, or I went up against, was Austin Booker. And I mean, I can't blame him. Like he is, and he's a game record. And just watching him develop and seeing him i mean he's he's developed for sure just from september to now too like they're like you've got to give him credit for that too because and the, this is a, a hallmark i think of what has pulled kansas out of you know some of their rougher moments in the past is they just get better and better and develop week over week you know they they have really accelerated growth in this program week over week where i don't think other teams have it quite the same way and I think Booker's one of those guys that you point to. Um, I'm really excited for, you know, for all the accolades. He deserves them. I know, like, and he's gonna have he's gonna have a he's gonna have a a tough decision to make. Personally, for me, if this is gonna sound like I'm just like I think uh, this isn't me just saying this as someone that loves Kansas football. I think he should come back. I think there is another level of physical development that he can take. I think there's another level of technical consistency he can take. And I think what will happen is if he comes back, he'll be a top 50 pick. And I think he might even be a first round pick. He's going to be on so many short lists. If he comes back, BMAC, like it's crazy. The yeah. list of players that people focus on for next year's the 2025 draft, Austin Booker will be on it. Yeah. He will be on it and he will be on it as a guy that could potentially wind up as a first round pick. That is the kind of opportunity I think he has ahead of him. Uh, I think he needs a little bit more development though, but like what, like that not to take away from what he's done, but my personal opinion, I think another year would do him really well just because I think there's, there's more physical development he has left. I think then, which is insane. I got that. It sounds insane, right? Like it yeah. sounds crazy, but like I genuinely believe there is more there for him to kind of develop physically and technically that can make him a a first round pick. Like that's the ceiling he has. Yeah, I think there's some lower body stuff he could do from a strength perspective, uh, just from a girth perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, I think those things would benefit him. Yep. He's also at that. He's at that um, that stage that I feel like a key to. I'll use a key to leave in Charles Gordon. They reach this stage where. It was like, hey, that guy's pretty good. And then the next year, you're like, oh, that guy's a star. Mm -hmm. Let's see how he plays with expectation. So with Charles, we never got to find that out. Charles left uh, 05. He did not. He could have played into 06. Yeah. He left in 05. 05. 06 would have been the year to prove the expectations. He moved on. And he made it in the NFL anyway if it wasn't for an injury. But in terms of draft position, he, he ended up going undrafted. Akeem faced the same thing in 2006 where he had six interceptions. He had the same choice Booker has now, you know, as a first team All Big Twelve, like Akib was, all the measurables you want, but there was still something missing. And for Akib, it was maturity and like development in terms of understanding film study, understanding secondary play, understanding all these little intricacies of the game. So Akib goes from a fourth round pick to a first round pick, mm -hmm. and I, that's the that's the bridge that Booker stands on now. To where what will it be next year when the expectations are on you, when the attention is on you? How will you respond? And I think that's where people prove their worth as as top picks. Yeah, and I think yeah, like I, there's just a like I think that's the case that I would. I'm not trying to I, I'm not trying to make a case, but like that's that's how I would see it, right? Like that's kind of just how I see it for him. Um, I not Don make like, shout out Kobe Bryant. He's got another decision to make as well. Um, like, he's obviously another guy that's got another decision as well. Um, he didn't really get as many. It's funny, like, because like teams actively avoid avoided Kobe Bryant, right? Yeah. And then uh, Audible mentioned Melo Dotson gets his love too, which he deserves because we've talked yeah. about a lot of him. I think Melo Dotson is going to be an NFL player someday. 
Uh, I think Kobe Bryant definitely has that ability to, for sure. Like his ball skills are tremendous, which we saw this week against Cincinnati. So it's just, I, he was second team all uh, all all conference last year, right? Is I that right, Kobe? Kobe? He might have been first team again. Might have been first. Team. I yeah. don't know. I just know that like the dude makes all kinds of plays, and teams try to avoid him. And then when they don't avoid him, watch what happens. <laughs> Kobe yes. Bryant goes out and make makes a play, and like yeah. he's like that. Good for him getting getting his accolades again. I mean, he if he comes back, I think he's a a short list for you know all American next yes. year if he returns. Yes, I, I I see no issues there. I love that he's getting a little bit better about baiting you know quarterbacks into throwing his direction. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a little um, his techniques are a little questionable when he's playing when he's trying to bait, but you can see his makeup, speed, length, and ball skills are. I mean. You know, there's just not many players like him just from a fluidity perspective. Um, you know, the way he can get back and recover and then be in a position to make a play on the ball almost always, um, you know, aggressive with his hands and his length tackles. I thought his tackling this year proved a lot. Um, I think he'll be an interesting player this year. I think, like you said, you know, he's on that key line as well, even though he's a little bit more. The expectations were a little higher coming into this season, but he's on that level to where he can solidify himself as a top 100 top 50. I think it's it's like his is going to be more fascinating for me. Like I think Kobe's is like I don't know if he'll ever be able to put on more weight than he can now, mm-hmm. and so he he be a little bit on the slender side. He's playing you know in the you know one eighty maybe I think he's listed at one seventy six. Um, so like who knows if he can really physically you know build you know get add more to his his frame at all. But I mean. I'll be, uh, the Mississippi State corner. Ma, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's not Martin yeah. Emerson. It's uh, Forbes. It's Martin, is his name. I can't uh, Emmanuel it. Forbes. Emmanuel yes. Forbes. Right. And so, so you know, right. you know, six one ish, two seven, one seventy ish. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, to be fair, he's had his issues this struggle. year. He's struggled. He's had his issues this yeah. year. So that you know, that's that that might be going against him a little bit, but um, you know, he's proven a lot here in a short amount of time. Dominic Cooney, also another first team uh, selection. And I tweeted this out today. People are going to be surprised at how high Dominic Cooney goes this year. In this mm-hmm. draft. Like, he's put together some fantastic tape. He's gotten better every year. He's got some inside, wherever you put him, inside, outside versatility. He could probably hold up at a tackle spot if you really wanted him to. Mm-hmm. Um, but man, he probably right tackle in the NFL, not left. But um, I, I I think he's a, a plug and play guy at the next level, and just it's just so crazy to see his development. But he got honorable mention offensive lineman of the year, and he deserves it. Yeah, he's one of the best offensive linemen in the Big Twelve. And I saw some I, some people I really like and respect. They put him in their top. Uh, he was number fifty one on their board. Uh, yeah, and there's they have a big offensive line nerd in that group that was evaluating him. They did him as the 51st best prospect in the entire draft. I will not be stunned if he goes that high. I will not be stunned if he goes that high. Uh, he's put together a fantastic season, and I just it's been he's one of my favorite players to watch. Easy, easy, easy guy to root for. Uh, plays all over the offensive line. Literally played every position but center last year. Uh, literally played every position but center, uh, which is incredible in his first year in the program. This year he is just. M- moved over to left tackle like it's an easy transition. Yeah. <laughs> it's not not only is it an easy transition for him, he's the best player in his position in the whole league. Yeah. Uh, that's yep. not as easy as he made it look. So I, I, it's not. Like it, we talked about it at the beginning of the year. It was like, you know, okay, they're moving Pooney over there. Like he was an awesome guard. He was getting accolades. He deserved them all. They throwed him out there. And what does he do? He he's literally the best. Like he was, he was <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. I, it's so impressive what what he put together. Sorry, it's just it's crazy. No, no I'm I, hey, if you want to if you want to go Pooney to the max anytime, call me because I love <laughs> I, I love his personality. I love his approach. He's just a very humble, hardworking guy. Um, you know, someone I've really enjoyed covering just because he, you know, two week couple weeks ago in practice, he was taking center reps. You know, like he's just a. I mean, this guy could do it all, man. He's just a guy that can do it all, and he deserves to be compensated for all that skill. 
It's going to be interesting, like from an NFL draft perspective. I know I'm taking a few of those little angles here. Like his arm length is going to be something that they're going to pay attention to about his his projection to you know where if they even want to try him at tackle. You know, there's going to be some certain tackle thresholds that people prefer with their arm length, and if you're on the fringe, you might still get a shot. But if not, you're you're just going to be an interior guy. That's something that you have to pay attention with him. You know, some of his arm length and stuff to kind of you know uh, figure out his projection. And where teams might want to start him. But even if he's an interior only guy, he's going to be a plug and play for a long time in the NFL. Like that is just a really good football player. And uh, I, yeah, he's one of my favorite, he's easily one of my favorite players to watch. And how, how sound and consistent he's been, it's, it's amazing, man. Yeah. Coming from D2 to this is just, man. It's nuts, dude. They identified him off of one game of film in 21. He played one game in 21 uh, and was injured. And they had they had to evaluate 2019, where he was all conference as a freshman, and one game of 2021. And KU said, yeah, come on down. So uh, that tells you what they're looking at, and they know what they're looking at. Well, Scott Fuchs is a phenomenal offensive yeah. line coach, too. Yeah. He, uh, he's one of, I, I think, that there's a lot of credit for him because – his player development is absurd and watching some of these guys just get better year in and year out. Like it's so it's kind of, you know, I, I know I speak on the pain of the past and, and some of this stuff, but like just the way people viewed Bryce cable do when he was having to play as a true freshman and how much improved he's even got a great season this year. He did. He really did. And it's just, like the, the player development is nuts. And so like, you know, people, I think people probably don't appreciate Bryce Cable do right. Because they think of their first impressions of Bryce Cable do and have held, have held on to them. And mm-hmm. like, you can't do that for any player in a, in no. a Kansas uniform no. while with this, with this program and the way it's running because of the development of these kids, man, it's, it's insane. Like that's why there's just so much reason for optimism for me with like you be back. You, you said the other day, you know, we the, the KU's basically, you know, not touched two recruiting classes yet. There's a there's a whole wave of youngsters that are yes. going to be on this same developmental arc that are going to be, you know, kind of in the same vein that you're seeing these players develop the way they are now. Come on, like, yeah. I don't know if anybody stuck with the TV version all the way to the end, but I want to talk about a guy named Calvin Clements. Yes, you do. Oh my. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you guys have seen Calvin Clement. He's number 75. He's a true freshman. He's the biggest person on the team. And that's saying a lot because Armaje Reed Adams, who just effortlessly moved to right tackle and is playing phenomenal football. He you know, started whatever the games. No big deal. He's been phenomenal. They call him the big dog. They call Armaje the big dog. He's just bigger than everyone except Calvin. Calvin will be standing next to, uh, last year, he was standing next to Earl Bostic, you know, on the sideline. Earl wasn't in, in pads. He'd moved on. And, you know, Earl's a good 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, he's just towering over him. So, fast forward to the end of the KU Cincinnati game. Fun fact, Kansas had 42 points on 39 plays. Hmm. <laughs> before, they, before they put their backups in. So, that's so much efficiency. Almost 11 and a half yards per play at that point. Mm-hmm. Which is just disgusting. But anyway, if you were paying attention, go back and watch the film and watch left tackle Calvin Clements. Watch how heavy his hands are. Watch him climb to the second level. Watch his bend. Watch his finish. Oh, my God. I mean, I had heard them talk about him uh, because he was on the 2D. He was one of three freshmen on the 2D to start mm-hmm. the season. And I had heard them talk about him pretty glowingly. Um, and the the... The experience of watching it matched what I had heard about him. He was, and I, I know it sounds like I'm being a little bit over the top, but if you're if you're looking at a tackle prospect, you won't see many that look like and play like that guy. He's put weight on quickly too, and like he came in pretty good weight anyway. Like, don't get me wrong, but like he's carrying what he's carrying well. I think he's already up to like three fifteen as a true freshman. Like he's a guy that's showing an ability to to kind of hold some weight. And yeah, he's carrying it phenomenally. One thing I was thinking about when I was watching that that BMAC, it's like, imagine like when was the last time that KU had a two deep 
offensive line like that. Like I was watching that group going like, I mean, it's you saw that line of scrimmage too. <laughs> that I, line getting mean. I was trying to gauge like I was trying to you know because like obviously like I I don't think Corleone was in at that point, and so Dante Corleone, and it's like you know so they're beating up on some you know some two D maybe from Cincinnati or you know, but like that group looked better than some and it's got veterans you know it's got a it had a spencer lavelle on there like that was an experienced group at nolan gorsica like they had some veterans on there that you know ku probably would have been jealous of that offensive line in years past yeah and and so like you know the the optimism for the front even losing a potential top 50 ish pick in dominic pooney like there's reason to be optimistic and this line's going to be good and they've got at least one more draft pick on there in our Marjorie Dams. He's going to be a draft pick someday. Um, it's man, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun watching. It's fun watching this team block it. And I think Scott Fuchs has done an incredible job. Um, you know, I, shout out. I'm, I'm going through the list of these all all Big Twelve guys. Like eleven winning it. Shout out Devin Neal. Another tough decision. You know, I we've talked. I don't. Have we talked about? Have, have I talked about Devin Neal on here? Like my perspective on him. Have I if I brought it on air? I can't remember. Yeah, it's just a, as about his uh, pro potential, that kind of thing. Or yeah, I I love him as a pro. Like I think he I think he can find a role. But I I think I I did an I did a st- I did an exercise the other the other day looking at some draft picks and like where I would kind of fit him in. Roshan Johnson, pretty good draft pro or pretty pretty good running back last year, right? Mm-hmm. He went one fifteen. So Ty J Spears, that two lane running back that ran all over the world. Yeah, pick it, pick eighty eight, right? So, I I just wonder, like, you know, that's the difference between a day two and a day three guy, right? I think I think there's still meat on the bone for for Neil to develop as a pass catcher, as a route runner. I think the ability to show that, and if he can show that more, he'll be he'll be in the Ty J Spears range. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I, I think he could, you know, we'll see. Like, I, I think he could sneak into the top 100 still, but I think there's still another layer he can show as a player that could really accelerate his draft stock. And that's especially, you know, he's, he's a good size back, but he's not Roshan Johnson big either. So, like, if you're going to be on this, not smaller side, but if you're not going to be as big as a Roshan, having some pass catcher traits on display on tape can be a valuable asset for him. So that's like, but it's also a running back, right? Like it's it's a tough position to try to. It's also a tough position to stay, right? So like that's just that's gonna be a really tough decision for him. Like I think there's I think there's arguments for both. I I I see how he could help his stock by coming back and build a legacy. I, he already has a legacy, but yeah, I don't know. It's gonna be an interesting one for me. Yeah, for me, I, he's. Uh, I said at the beginning of the year I thought he should go because you know backs only have X amount of carries. You know, he there's things that he could improve on, you know, like uh, showing that he can catch. But, you know, in high school, he was a big time receiving back. So I, I have no doubts about that. U- ultimately, as a player, um, I have no doubts about where he fits. I don't see that his game has clearing weaknesses, especially since he improved so much as a blocker. Um, so I think as an NFL player, it won't matter that much this year or next. You know, I think he'd be around the same places. It's just more about fit. But what I'll say is the legacy play is massive right now. I would love to go to a Memorial Stadium, a David Booth Kansas Memorial Stadium with the Devin Neal statue in front of it. Hmm. And if he comes back and is the all-time leading rusher at a school where John Riggins and Gail Sayers played and the all-time leading touchdown man, and he's from Lawrence, Kansas. And a Big 12 champion. And his team to a potential Big 12 championship, which is very much on the table. I don't know if you guys have seen our schedule next year. It's not what it was this year. It's what I will say. So if you're returning almost 80% of your starters and one of them is named Devin Neal, then we're talking about a massive legacy play. So I would say it's a more about the legacy and it's NFL versus the legacy stuff. And like you said, he's already a ring of honor guy where he is right now, uh, you know, depending on how the pros go. But he should be somewhere around there anyway. So, I mean, it's not like his legacy is going to take a hit. He's good. He's, he's where he's supposed to be. But the major legacy play is still on the table. So I think those are the things he and he's a draft pick. Don't get me wrong. He's a draft pick this year. It's yeah. just the, you know, and if you come back and you're an earlier pick, teams feel a little bit more incentivized to utilize you differently and plan game plan you. It, you know, 
that's that's another piece of it too. The earlier you go, it's, I don't think the gap on pay between eighty and one fifteen is going to be just ginormous. But if you're the eightieth pick, you're more likely to get early opportunities because they they've le- they they've kind of top one hundred pick means they're trying to get you on the field as quickly as possible. And then the day three, I mean, not that they're not going to try, but like maybe a little bit more uphill battle, right? So I don't know. It's it's gonna be an interesting decision, and I think I I'd, I'd support whatever one you decided to make. But yeah, I think there's there's a there's a legacy to be had here for sure. Um, and then just shout out to all the all the honorable mentions: Lawrence Arnold, Jason Bean again, Austin Booker for defensive lineman of the year, Melo Dotson, Mason Fairchild. Neil for Offensive Player of the Year, Mike Davitsky, Dom Pooney for Offensive Lineman of the Year, Jamie Robinson. I think that's the right list. Like, I, if you're telling me, like, there's that's the kind of that's the list of guys that I would I would say have earned different honors. Um, I'm really glad Ma- Melo Dotson's getting his love. Um, I think he's a very intriguing NFL draft prospect as well. You know, Mason Fairchild. I think you know, like, also I think he's a draft pick as well. So um, they got some. It's just so crazy. And Jeremy Robinson too. I'm a Jeremy Robinson believer as well. I've I've yes. I've been I've been pretty consistent on him. They, the KU has some players that down the road could be NFL players. Some of them earlier than others. Um, right. And it's it's just that's what's so impressive in watching what Lance Leipold Lance Leipold had. I mean, BMAC Malcolm Coots from Buffalo was lining up for the for the Las Vegas Raiders this week. Yeah, he's better than the guy we just drafted in the top ten. <laughs> Tyree Wilson. He's not better. He's significantly better, and that's going <laughs> to be your problem. It's not like it's not like he's a little bit better. He's a lot better, and he has a. And did you hear that he grew two inches this offseason? Malcolm Coons did. Yes. Oh man, he grew two inches this offseason. Wow. So he, with his skill set and now an increase in length, uh, he's going to be a player that they're going to have to. They're going to want to keep around. Sure. You know, I, I. You know what I mean. I don't. Uh, I've never been that excited about Tyree. I always wonder about NFL players. If I'm calling the game and I don't know you, I don't feel great about that. And and I don't mean I didn't know who Tyree was going into the game because obviously I was going, I'm talking about my viewing experience. Sure, I want an NFL player to impact my viewing experience, and mm-hmm. Tyree did not. No. So you know, I just thought, man, he's tall. That's yeah. usually not a reason to draft people, just in general. But anyways, Malcolm Coots was a draft pick for Buffalo. Lance Leipold, key Lance Leipold and company, developing yeah. him. Jared Patterson, the running back. Buffalo really wasn't getting a ton of uh, draft picks or wins, period, before Lance Leipold got here, but his player development is just that good. And it's just, like, I, these guys, they can't, they've done the work, but the but but Lance Leipold and company have been a huge factor in helping get these guys to achieve new heights. And so it's just, man, it's just been special, man. It's been so fun to watch. Yeah. It's been such a fun year. And obviously, we'll find out where the bowl is, and that's going to be fun. Um, I just, I want the Pop Tart Bowl. That's what I want. Give me the Pop Tart Bowl. Give me Pop Tarts. Give me Orlando. It'll be a full circle moment for me, being that uh, 20 years ago, we played in the Tangerine Bowl in Orlando. Mm. Let's run it back. Let's go back to Orlando, have a good time. I won't get as drunk as I did when I was 18. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, get me time at the Tangerine Bowl, undefeated experience. Um, but you know, with with Kansas being off a little bit, I did want to talk about another quarterback that um, we both took some time to take a peek at. Mm-hmm. As we're talking about future excitement, uh, I want to hear your thoughts on Zeke Marshall, twenty twenty four commit uh, from Michigan. I tried to watch a little bit of that that state championship game where a they went up against a team with more college talent than they had. Not that they didn't have college talent. Don't get me wrong. They had a couple guys for sure uh, that had a 38 game win streak in Belleville. And Isaiah Marshall was the best player on the field. And that includes a quarterback who was the 2025 QB one. I think number one player in the entire class. He's good too. Don't get me wrong. But Isaiah Marshall is just the the playmaking ability that he has and the natural athleticism and the 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 confidence that he has to make some of the throws that he makes and do some of the things that he do it's like it's uncanny and it like I we were talking before this it reminds me it like it does remind me of Jalen Daniels um 
in some of the things that he does, it reminds me of of Jalen Daniels in in some ways scarily. Mm-hmm. Like and that's a that's a high comparison. And I know that. And like I'm not trying to put too much pressure on that kid because there's still a long way to go. But some of the some of the ways in which he throws the football and how he throws the football and the decisions he makes with the football, it's just it's so it reminds me of Jalen Daniels and the way he plays the game. Yes. I agree with you. I think it's a throwing posture a little bit. They've got similar shoulder motion, similar release, the very quick release guys. Um, you know, my favorite thing about a quarterback is when he can get to the top of his drop and sling it outside the numbers, like the real fastball. He's got that. I mean, he's got that in spades. And I always think that's a valuable tool because that allows a quarterback to attack the whole field. So that'll show you that he can go either sideline on a quick out or a stop route. He can kill you over the middle of the field. He can hit you with the deep ball. He can do all of those things. My favorite thing was the primary set that they were running was like this double wing, seven offensive linemen, three receiver, max protect, either pass or run. And it was incredible and unstoppable Mm -hmm. because you couldn't, it puts you in such a bind with these seven offensive linemen and the best runner of the football in the game was Isaiah Marshall. Mm-hmm. So he got the ball and he had two blockers on a pool. This guy was out of there. And he, the last drive of the game, he did with his feet. But most of the game, he did it with his arm, just his ability to sling the ball to the outside. I mean, he's the most polished Kansas quarterback prospect I've ever seen. Uh, it's up there. I, you're, you're right. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, that, that's probably the case. And, you know, you saw he was able to make a field throw sideline vertical down the field he was um you know through some really nice up and down balls even like watching like uh one of his interceptions like I understood what he was trying to do what he was trying to get to and how he was trying to do it and though it, it, it's weird kind of watching an interception and being reminded of like some of the things you like about Jalen Daniels but it was an uncomfortable platform trying to throw an up and down ball and I think he got a little bit hit as he's trying to throw it and the guy made a great play over it but it's just like he's the, the things that he's trying to accomplish as a passer, I think I really appreciate as well. And I think that's that's cannot be taken for granted because it's very rare to find a guy that can throw layered passes to all levels of the, of the of, over the defense. And he's got that. Um, and there's a oh, huge developmental arc to go for him, like every quarterback. Right. But as far as just the innate ability it's nuts. It's insane. Yeah. Like I, I, you know, I try not to, I'm not trying to heap too much pressure and I'm not trying to heap too many expectations. That's a special football player as a special football player, at least at this level, you know, we've seen, and you know, it's always going to be weird to see how kids respond in a college environment. There's, there's a lot of mile markers to go developmentally, but that dude is, is a special football player and he's got, he's got it. I, you know, <laughs> intangibles are very obvious with him as a player. And I think he's been someone that's kind of kind of helped bring this class together and keep it together. He's kind of one of those change agents and he's one of those guys that helps kind of keep this thing together because that's the kind of special football player he is. Yeah, and I mean, there's another guy on his team that's a four-star corner, Jalen Todd, who just go look at his offer sheet. I mean, it's the who's who of college football. So uh, they won a recruiting battle with these two players and you know, I just mentioned that because it, you know, they've never had a recruiting platform like this, you know, in their careers, in mm-hmm. the point in their careers. And they're taking advantage already. I mean, this was a top 40 class as recently as a, uh, a month or so ago. So like this, this, the way that they develop players and the way they've been able to recruit, I, you know, I used to think as a fan about, you know, Kansas recruiting and the, I've always thought about the limitations. These guys are building pipelines in places where there is no water. Uh, you know, like you go to Arizona and you end up with, you know, for the Deshaun Warner, who had been voted the best player in the state, uh, Ohio State and Michigan just offered him and three of his teammates and then an offensive line from a from a rival school. And they've just been able to do things that people just didn't think were possible here. And that speaks to their ability to just grind and do the work. Well, and I think um, if you remember when Lance Leipold was hired, one of the things that people were concerned about as a potential detraction from him being the the next head coach of Kansas was, well, he's never really recruited. He's never really had a great recruiting class. He's never, you know, they've never really been able to bring in, you know, the the top recruiting classes. 
and all he did was produce draft draft, draft picks at places that normally don't get him. Right. And so, okay, top 40 for a Kansas football program with that kind of developmental ability within the program, that's insane. That's 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 what's so terrifying for me is like, you know, we I don't I I didn't care if if Lance Leipold was a had a top thirty class, forty class, sixty class because I've just seen what you know I've seen this player develop. But if you are giving him a higher profile prospect to start developing, like that that's scary. That is scary. We're saying Leipold a lot, but this is a great coaching staff. Absolutely, I mean, this is a great coaching staff. I mean, and you know, if you you could just go down the line and look at, you know, the uh, from Panagos to Peterson uh, to Fuchs to Zabrowski as the semifinalist for assistant mm-hmm. coach here to AK to Kotelniki to Borland. I mean, there's just no weaknesses. There's just no weaknesses. It's been Jump, it's been amazing. Twenty nine year old coach. You know, just down the line. Coach uh, Sam. Terry Samuel, like they've they've it's amazing. And I, I, I keep, I hope I'm saying light holding company enough. Cause it is like, it is, it is not just, I mean, he's, it's not his hint for sure. This is an incredible coaching staff. I am perpetually nervous about, you know, losing them, you know? Cause like, I think if people are paying attention to Scott Fuchs and I mean, Cole Nicky, you know, there's the, the rumors about, they not one of, <laughs> I mean, how could they not be paying attention to what, yeah. just from a the player development standpoint, from a recruiting standpoint, yeah. Or, how they've been able to identify people in the transfer portal, like just all these things that add up to winning and excellence. They do them all. And that's what champions do. You don't yeah. win championships on accident. Like you don't win championships because your team's good. You win championships because you know how to do it. And mm-hmm. this guy knows how to do it. And he's flanked by a bunch of people that know how to do it too. Yeah. He's, I mean, he player, you know, it's, it's portal, you know, Scott Aligo and company. Just, yeah. I mean, I this is gonna sound like a, a weird anecdote, because like Jared versus talent was obvious. Jared versus out of Albany, K was his first offer. Mm-hmm. He's gonna be a top twenty pick this year at Florida State. Yeah. Um, and it's just like they just they they see him, and so like they offer dudes. I'm like, okay, you know, I there's so much implicit trust in what they've been able to pull together, uh, in the in the portal and in developing players, and it's just there's there's so many pieces of this program that are so highly run it's insane yeah and it's like that's why they're eight and four so fast and there's some speed bumps and you know there's some games that kansas wants back but you know that's part of it's part of the climb man yeah double double digit next year and and then some big 12s on the table next year it's gonna be a lot of fun uh, we'll, uh, we're not sure what week we'll be back. You know, we, we we'll, might take a little bit of downtime with the bowl game. We're kind of working through some of that stuff, but, uh, it's been a fun season B Mac and I can't wait to talk about one more football game with you. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's been, uh, it's been a great year and I've, I've had a lot of fun doing this with you, my friend. Absolutely, man. We got some more stuff to do. We got some more winning to do. How about that's nothing season for these Jayhawks? Let's go. I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait to see who KU plays. Can't wait to preview that game. That's it for this episode of Booth Review. That's BMAC. I'm Ken Swanson. We'll catch you later.